Hello everyone, welcome to my channel. I'm Mr. Samip Sinchudi and I'm here to help you understand sociology. In this video, I'll be talking about critical analysis made by Tumin on Davis and Moore's theory of stratification. Melvin M. Tumin was the American sociologist who has done vast research in race and stratification on class analysis. Tumin was born on February 10, 1919 and lived up to 3rd March 1994. He earned his undergraduate degree in psychology from University of Wisconsin-Madison in 1939. He received his PhD in sociology and anthropology from Northwestern University in 1944. In 1953, Melvin came up with principles of stratification and criticized Davis and Moore ideation on stratification, challenged the Davis-Moore hypothesis of social stratification in his paper, Some Principles of Stratification or Critical Analysis. Tumin took Davis and Moore to imply that Social stratification was mostly inevitable and provided a positive functionality of stratification or institutionalized social inequality in rewards allocated in accordance with some notion of the greater and lesser functional importance of various positions. He analyzed the argument of Davis and Moore and found them lacking in a number of respects. The possible alternative meaning of the concept functional importance have been shown to be problematic. The question of the scarcity of abundance of available talent has been indicated as a principal source of possible variation. The extent to which the period of training for skilled position may reasonably be viewed as sacrificial has been called into question. The possibility has been suggested that very different type of motivational scheme might conceivably be made to function. The separability of differentials in power and property considered as sources appropriate to a task from such differentials considered as rewards for the performance of a task has also been suggested. It has also been maintained that differentials in prestige and esteem do not necessarily follow upon differentials in power and property when the latter are considered as appropriate resources rather than rewards. Finally, some negative functions or dysfunctions of institutionalized social inequality have been tentatively identified revealing the mixed character of the outcome of social stratification and casting doubt on the contention that social inequality is thus an unconsciously evolved device by which societies ensure that the most important positions are constitutionally filled by the most qualified persons. There are seven propositions of Davis and Moore hypothesis that Tumin has identified and following this, he has sequentially arranged about the shortcoming in Davis Moore treatment of stratification. To quote Tumin, it is therefore most curious that the basic premises and implications of the assumption have only been most casually explored by American sociologists. An assumption here means about the stratification because according to Tumin, inequality is present everywhere simultaneously and it existed since time immemorial. And according to Tumin, since inequality is universal and existed since time immemorial, Tumin thinks that this might have caused us to believe that there must be something both inevitable and positively functional about such social arrangement and this arrangement is nothing but stratification. At this point, it is very important to explain what functionalist perspective is and how functionalists try to see social stratification. According to the functionalist theory, social stratification emerges from the essential functional necessity of the society and is thus a fundamentally requisite and is inevitable attribute of human society. The functional theorists 
argue that social stratification is functional, beneficial, and constructive feature of society. It generates consensus, integration, and social solidarity in the society by accomplishing its fundamental need insofar as it distributes roles and duties as per the intent and capabilities of the individual as a member of the society. Accordingly, social stratification emerges out of the society and not out of the requirements of some particular members of the society. The functional theorists therefore justify social stratification, asserting it as a functional prerequisite of the society. Role allocations is constituted according to functionalist on the basis of individual ability and societal needs. Social rewards are desperately awarded to various persons according to their ability, services, and positions in the society. After having said that about functionalist view on stratification, now to further understand the two means critical analysis of Davis Moore stratification, let's understand the principle of stratification by Davis and Moore itself. Though in my previous lecture, I have already presented the detailed understandings of some principle of stratification by Davis and Moore, and to view that, you can press the i button on the right top of the screen and visit the lecture. And for now, let us once again briefly discuss Davis and Moore's hypothesis on stratification, so that we will be able to understand better the critical analysis provided by Tumin to Davis Moore theory. In 1945, sociologists Kingsley Davis and Wilbert Moore published the Davis Moore thesis, which argued that the greater the functional importance of a social role, the greater must be the reward. The theory poses that social stratification represents the inherently unequal value of different work. Certain tasks in society are more valuable than others. Therefore, qualified people who fill those positions must be rewarded more than others. Let me briefly tell you about Davis and Moore. Kingsley Davis was born on 20th August 1908 and lived up to 27 February 1997. And Wilbert E. Moore was born on 26th October 1914 and he lived up to 29 December 1987. In April 1945, Davis and Moore published an influential article with entitled Some Principles of Stratification, which was a very influential functionalist account of the reason for social inequality. And for this, Davis and Moore synthesized Durkheim and Parson to argue for the functional necessity of some position over other. Those that are highest paid go to the most deserving individuals at the same time the differential reward motivates individuals to work to fill the position. Thus, from this perspective, illness is a deviant state because it means that the individual may not be able to fill their role. Sociologists see this article as a paradigmatic case of functionalist logic and indeed Davis came to be a leading figure in this school of sociology. Before we move on to understand the critical view of Tumin on principle of stratification by Davis and Moore, let us try to understand the central argument advanced by Davis and Moore in a number of sequential propositions. Davis and Moore has stated their work from the proposition that no society is classless or unstratified. An effort is also made by Davis and Moore to explain in functional terms that the stratification is universal in any social system. Next, an attempt is made by Davis and Moore to explain the roughly uniform distribution of prestige as between the major types of position in every society because there occurs a great difference in the degree and kind of stratification between one society from another society. And some attention is also given to the variety of social inequality and the variable factor that gives rise to stratification. They also tells us that while we try to understand their principles of stratification, it will be necessary to keep in mind 
that the discussion is related to the system of positions and not to the individuals occupying those positions. To clear this point further on their formulation, Davis and Moore puts forth the question amongst the reader that it is one thing to ask why different positions carry different degree of prestige and quite another to ask how certain individuals get into those positions. They further suggest the reader to keep in mind that although both questions are related, but it is essential to keep them separate in our thinking. To understand their principles of stratification, it will be necessary to keep in mind that the discussion is related to the system of position and not to the individuals occupying those positions. Davis and Moore assume that only a limited number of individuals have the talent to acquire the skills necessary for the functionally most important positions. They also stated that in most cases, the degree of skill required for a job determines that job's importance. They said, the most skill required for a job, the fewer qualified people there would be to do that job. The task of every society is to place and motivate individuals in this social structure. As a functioning mechanism, a society must distribute its member in social position and induce them to perform the duties of this position. The society must take concern to motivate individuals at two different levels. Number one, to instill in the proper individual the desire to fill certain position and number two, once the individual reaches the positions, to instill in him the desire to perform the duties attached to that position. Further, they have talked about reward disposal. Quoting them, one may ask what kind of reward a society has at its disposal in distributing its personnel and securing essential services. And the answer that they have provided is, it has first of all the things that contribute to sustenance and comfort. The second is that the thing that contribute to humor and diversion and finally, the thing that contribute to self-respect and ego expansion. The differential access to the basic regards of the society has as consequence the differentiation of the prestige and esteem which various strata acquires. At this point, inequality serves two functions and for this we can specify the two factor that determines the relative rank of different positions. In general, those positions give them the best reward and hence has the highest rank that have the greatest importance for the society because of its function and its importance and requires the great training of talent as it is concerns means and is a matter of scarcity. Davis and Moore have tended to assume that the most highly rewarded positions are indeed the most important. However, many occupations which offered little prestige or economic reward can be seen as vital to society. Therefore, a society must see that less essential positions do not compete with more important. If a position is easily filled, then we may not reward them with more even though it might be important. On the other hand, if the position is of important one but hard to fill the vacancy, the reward must be high enough to get it filled anyway. Davis and Moore believe that rewarding most important work with high level of income, prestige and power encourages people to work harder and longer. As quoted from Davis and Moore, actually a society does not need to reward position in proportion to their functional importance. It merely needs to give sufficient rewards to them to ensure that they will be filled competently. In other words, it must be seen that the less essential position do not compete with more important one. If a position is easily filled, it need not be heavily rewarded, even though important. On the other hand, if it is very important but hard to fill, the reward must be high enough to get it filled anyway. According to Davis and Moore, practically all positions, no matter how acquired, 
requires some form of skill or capacity for performance. There are ultimately only two ways in which a person's qualification come about, through inherent capacity or through training. Obviously in concrete activities both are always necessary, but from a practical standpoint the scarcity may lie primarily in one or the other as well as in both. According to Davis and Moore, the major function of unequal reward is to motivate talented individuals and allocate them to the functionally most important positions. The most important roles are attained by most deserving people of the society, thus the most deserving people get the most wealth. They stated that a society with no stratification is just a myth, thus it is a universal phenomenon. For a better functioning of society, the stratification is necessary. They presume that inequality serves for a better society. Below are the seven propositions that make up the structural functional theory of social stratification as summarized by Tumin. This statement argues that social stratification is functional and it is necessary for maintaining a society's state of equilibrium. Number one, certain positions in any society are more functionally important than other and require special skills for their performance. Number two, only a limited number of individuals in any society have the talent which can be trained into the skill appropriate to this position, that is the more functionally important positions. Number three, the conversion of talents into skills involves a training period during which sacrifice of one kind or another are made by those undergoing the training. Number 4. In order to induce the talented persons to undergo these sacrifices and acquire the training, their future positions must carry an inducement value in the form of differential privilege and disproportionate access to the scarce and desired reward which the society has to offer. Number 5. This scarce and desired good consists of right and prerequisites attached to or built into. The positions can be classified into those things which contribute to sustenance and comfort, humor and diversion, self-respect and ego expansion. Number 6. This differential access to the built reward of the society has as consequence the differentiation of the prestige and esteem which various strata acquire. This may be said along with the rights and prerequisites to constitute institutionalized social inequality that is stratification. Number 7. Therefore, social inequality among different strata is the amount of scars and desired goals and the amount of prestige and esteem which they receive is both positively functional and inevitable in any society. Tumin presented a comprehensive criticism of this Davis and Moore theory. Nearly after about nine years in August 1953, Tumin countered Davis Moore theory in his paper entitled Some Principles of Stratification or Critical Analysis. He begins by questioning the adequacy of this measurement of the functional importance of position and by posing a question, what determines a job degree? Davis Moore proposition has been criticized by Tumin as fallacious from a number of different angles. The first problem for Tumin is that they possess reward as a guarantee of performance. When rewards are supposed to be based on merit in their argument, it is argued that if an ability were inherent, there would be no need of a reward system. Secondly, according to Tumin, Davis and Moore do not clearly indicate why some positions should be worth more than others, other than the fact that they are remunerated more. Claiming, for example, the teachers are equally, if not more, functionally necessary than athletes and movie stars, yet they receive significant lower incomes. This critics has suggests that structural inequality, that is inherent wealth, family power, etc., is itself a cause of individual success or failure rather than a consequence of it. Class analysts have also pointed out that it is not merely income that determines inequality but wealth, access to social networks and cultural practices that put some individuals in better position than others to succeed.
Let's discuss critical response by Tumin on Davis Moore hypothesis in details. According to Tumin, fact of social inequality in human society is marked by its ubiquity and its antiquity. Every known society, past and present, distributes its scarce and demanded goods and services unequally, and there are attached to the position which command unequal amount of such goods and services certain highly morally toned evaluations of their importance for the society. The ubiquity and the antiquity of such inequality has given rise to the assumption that there must be something both inevitable and positively functional about such social arrangement. For Davis and Moore's assumption, stating that stratification is a global phenomena, he raised a question asking whether something is practiced everywhere need not be practiced further. Therefore, Tumin finds clearly the truth or falsity of such an assumption is a strategic question for any general theory of social organization. It is therefore most curious that the basic premises of implication of the assumption have only been most casually explored by American sociologists. He criticized the set pattern of practicing stratification which does not account for any betterment of the society. Let's take the Davis Moore proposition and examine them one by one. First proposition, certain position in any society are more functionally important than others and require special skills for their performance. According to Tumin, the key term here is functionally important. Further, he says, the functionalist theory of social organization is by no means clear and explicit about this term. This concept immediately involves a number of puzzling and confusing questions to him. Among these are 1. The issue of minimum versus maximum survival 2. Whether a proposition is a useless and just a representation using different words which are faulty because any status quo at any given moment is nothing more than everything present in the status quo. In these terms, all acts and structures must be judged positively functional in that they constitute essential portions of the status quo. 3. What kind of calculus or functionality exists that will enable us to add and subtract long and short rich consequences with their mixed qualities and arrived at some summative judgment of functionality? The second proposition of Davis and Moore states that only a limited number of individuals in any society have the talent that can be trained into the skill appropriate to the most functionally important positions. Now to counter this, according to Tumin, the truth of these propositions depends at least in part of the truth of these propositions. For him, Davis and Moore Assume that only a limited number of individuals have the talent to acquire the skill necessary for the functionally most important position. And two men regard this as a very questionable assumption. Firstly, an effective method of measuring talent and ability has yet to be devised. Secondly, there is no proof that exceptional talents are required for that position which Davis and Moore considers important. And thirdly, the pool of talent in society may be considerably larger than Davis and Moore's assumption. As a result, unequal reward may not be necessary to harness it. Tumin further says that, in this context, it may be asserted that there is some noticeable tendency for elite to restrict further access to their privileged position once they have sufficient power to enforce such restriction. This is especially true in a culture where it is possible for elite to contribute a high demand and a proportionately higher reward for its work by restricting the number of the elites available to do the work. The third proposition of Davis and Moore states that the conversion of talent into skills involves a training period during which sacrifices of one kind or another are made by those undergoing this training. Now, according to Tumin, Davis and Moore introduced here a concept sacrifice that comes 
closer than any of the rest of their vocabulary of analysis to bring a direct reflection of the rationalization offered by the more fortunate members of a society of the rightness of their occupancy of privileged position. Further he interrogates that, in our present society, for example, what are the sacrifices that talented person undergo in the training period? The possible serious losses involves the surrender of earning power and the cost of the training. The latter is generally borne by the parents of the talented youths undergoing training and not by the trainee themselves. There is second, the extremely highly valued privilege of having greater opportunity for self-development. There is third, at the psychic grain involves in which allowed to delay the assumption of adult responsibility such as earning a living and supporting a family. And there is fourth, the excess of leisure and freedom of a kind not likely to be experienced by the person already at work. The fourth proposition of Davis and Moore states that to induce the talented person to undergo these sacrifices and acquire the training, their future position must carry an inducement value in the form of differential that is privileged and disproportionate access to the scarce and desired reward that the society has to offer. Tumin also questions the view that the training required for important positions should be regarded as sacrifice and therefore in need of compensation. Thus, Tumin argues that, let us assume for the purpose of the discussion that the training period is sacrificial and the talent is rare in every convincible human society. There is still the basic problem as to whether the allocation of different reward is scarce and desired goods and services is the only or the most effective way of recruiting the appropriate talent to this position. He points to the reward of being student laser, freedom and the opportunity for self-development. He notes that any loss of earning and usually be made up during the first 10 years of work. Differential rewards during this period may be justified. However, Tumin sees no reason for continuing this compensation for the rest of any individual's working life. The fifth proposition of Davis Moore hypothesis states that the scare and desirable goods consist of rights and prerequisites attached to or built into the position and can be classified into those things that contribute to sustenance and comfort, humor and diversion, self-respect and ego expansion. With the classification of the rewards offered by Davis and Moore, Tumin considered that there need be little argument. Some question must be raised, however, as to whether any reward system built into a general stratification system must allocate equal amount of all three types of reward in order to function effectively, or whether one type of reward may be emphasized to the virtual neglect of other. This raises the further question regarding which type of emphasis is likely to prove more effective as a differential inducer. Nothing in the known fact about human motivation impel us to favor one type of reward over the other or to insist that all three types of reward must be built into the position in comparable amount if the position is to have an inducement value. Their sixth proposition states that this differential access to the basic regards of the society has as consequence the differentiation of the prestige and esteem which various strata acquires. Here, Tumin questions the view that social stratification functions to integrate the social system. He argues that reward can encourage hostility, suspicion and distrust among the various segments of a society. Stratification is divisive rather than an integrating force and it can weaken social integration by giving member of the lower strata a feeling of being excluded from participation in the large society. This is particularly apparent in system of racial stratification. Tumin argues that 
Davis and Moore have ignored the influence of power on the unequal distribution of reward. Thus, differences in pay or differences in their power rather than their functional importance. For example, the differences between the wages of farm laborers and coal miners can be interpreted as a result of the bargaining power of the two groups. Tumin maintains that it is only when there is generally equal access to recruitment and training for all potential talented persons that differential reward can conceivably be justified as functional. The seventh proposition of Davis and Moore states that social inequality among different strata in the amount of scars and desired goods and the amount of prestige and esteem which they receive is both positively functional and inevitable in any society. According to Davis and Moore, the major functions of unequal reward is to motivate talented individuals and allocate them to the functionally most important positions. And Tumen rejects this view he argues that social stratification can and often does act as a barrier to the motivation and recruitment of talent. Tumin suggests that if the objections which have heretofore been raised are taken as reasonable, then it may be stated that the only item that any society must distribute unequally are the power and property necessary for the performance of different tasks. If such differential power and property are viewed by all as consummate with the differential responsibilities and if they are culturally defined as resources and not as rewards, then no differential in prestige and esteem need follow. Tumin further suggests that every relatively open system of stratification erects barrier to the motivation and recruitment of talent. There is considerable evidence to suggest that the class system in Western industrial society limits the possibility of the discovery and utilization of talents. In general, the lower an individual class position, the more likely he is to leave school at the minimum living age and he less likely to aspire and strive for a highly rewarded position. Thus, the motivation to succeed is unequally distributed throughout the class system. As a result, social class can act as an obstacle to the motivation of talent. Historically, the evidence seemed to be that Every time power and property are distributed unequally, no matter what the cultural definition, prestige and esteem definitions have tended to result as well. Historically, however, no systematic effort has ever been made under propitious circumstances to develop the tradition that each person is as socially worthy as all other persons who perform their appropriate tasks constituously. While such a tradition seemed utterly utopian, no known facts in psychological or social science have yet demonstrated its impossibility or its dysfunctionality for the continuity of a society. Along with other negative functions of institutionalized social inequality, some dysfunctions of stratification have also been identified by Tumin in the form of provisional assertion that have been stated by Tumin as follows. 1. Social stratification system functions to limit the possibility of discovery of the full range of talents available in a society. 2. In foreshortening the range of available talents, social stratification system functions to set limit upon the possibility of expanding the productive resources of the society, at least relative to what might be the case under the conditions of greater equality of opportunity. 3. Social stratification system functions to provide the elite with the political power necessary to procure acceptance and dominance of an ideology which rationalizes the status quo whatever it may be as logical, natural and morally right. In this manner, social stratification systems functions as essentially conservative influence in the societies in which they are found. 4. 
Social stratification system functions to distribute favorable self images unequally throughout a population. To the extent that such favorable self images are requisite to the development of inherent creative potential, to that extent stratification system functions to limit the development of the creative potential. 5. To the extent that inequality in social reward cannot be made fully acceptable to the less privileged in a society, social stratification system functions to encourage hostility, suspicions and distrust among the various segments of a society and thus to limit the possibility of extensive social integration. 6. To the extent that the sense of significant membership in a society depends on one's place on the prestige ladder of the society, social stratification system functions to distribute unequally the sense of significant membership in the population. 7. To the extent that loyalty to a society depends on a sense of significant membership in the society, Social stratification system functions to distribute loyalty unequally in the population. 8. To the extent that participation and apathy depend upon the sense of significant membership in the society, social stratification system functions to distribute the motivation to participate unequally in a population. Each of the eight foregoing propositions contain implicit hypothesis regarding the consequences of unequal distribution of reward in a society in accordance with some notion of the functional importance of various positions. These are empirical hypotheses subject to test. They are offered here only as exemplary of the kind of consequences of social stratification which are not offer taken into account in details with the problems. In conclusion, the Davis-Moore theory, though open for debate, was an early attempt to explain why stratification exists. The theory states that social stratification is necessary to promote excellence, productivity and efficiency, thus giving people something to strive for. Davis and Moore believe that the system serves society as a whole because it allows everyone to benefit to a certain extent. In a reply to Tumin's criticism, Davis stated that his theory seeks to explain inequality rather than justify it. Davis also accused Tumin of a number of errors. We shall discuss in the next lecture the reply of Kingsley Davis to Tumin for his criticism. Till then, watch my other videos and for more updates and infos related to sociology, like, share and subscribe my channel. Thank you.